If I said to you, the brain is absolutely crucial in leadership, you'd go, yeah, don't need to teach me to suck eggs. But if you look at neuroscience and you applied neuroscience to business, how would that help you measure a return on investment? This is The Money Makers. I'm Bruce Whitfield. Tonight, I'm acting sane and joined by Dr. Tara Swart, who is an author, psychiatrist, to discuss the impact of the brain on business leadership. And of course, you could have a brain to be a business leader. It's a bit more complicated, I guess. You're essentially being paid to use your brain. Yes. Um, Isn't everybody? Mo most In a knowledge economy, most people yes. are. If you knew a few key things about how it works and how you could get the most out of it, that could, you could really leverage that to get sort of a lot more performance out of your brain than people do. People sort of blindly go through a day using their body as the taxi that takes their brain from meeting to meeting, mm -hmm. not resting it, not refueling it, not hydrating it. Um, oxygenating it, etc. So those are some very basic physical things that you can do to improve your performance. Now, psychiatry, neuroscience and business, just explain these connections. Um, well, I started off life as a medical doctor and I specialised in psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And that's all about how people think and feel and therefore how they behave in the outside world. So not too much of a transition to the executive suite, really. Okay, well, if you want to understand megalomania, I mean, chief executives. <laughs> um, sorry, it's such a Freudian slip. But you, you really do need to understand the workings of the brain. Hmm. Are CEOs wired differently to the rest of us? Or do they simply use their wiring better? There's no evidence that CEOs are wired differently to the rest of us, but there is a little bit of evidence that the brains of traditional CEOs versus the brains of entrepreneur founders CEOs are actually working quite differently. Mm, okay, well that makes sense, but that's just because they're different personalities, different kind of people, or not? Um, it could be partly due to personality um, and obviously things like confidence and self-belief, but these things are actually connected to hormone levels like testosterone. So things like risk-taking, um, and uh, risk appetite and confidence that's connected to testosterone. So these psychological factors that we know about have a physiological underpinning. And as a neuroscientist, that's what we're interested in. Okay, so how do I best manage my brain to optimally use it throughout the day? I mean, you talk about the fact that it's, it's a resource, it's got mm. a, a limited capacity, and mm. the theory, you know, the, the pop, uh, pop, uh, pop culture will tell you we only use 5% of our brain, you know. It, is that even true? That's another one of those neuro mm. myths we need to bust. Um, so there was a Holly, Hollywood film based on the fact that we only use 10% of our brains. 10%? I found that sorry, I only use 5 <laughs> 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 um, no. I found that quite difficult to watch. Um, so we use different parts of our brains at different times. The more we're using and interconnecting at the same time, the better. Mm. Um, and that's within an individual brain, but also in terms of leveraging diversity of thinking in teams and organizations. So I would say to get the most out of your brain, you need to sleep seven to nine hours per night. Right. Tick. <laughs> Good. Um, you need to have three high quality meals per day, including brain boosting types of foods. Mm -hmm. um, you need to drink half a litre of water for every 15 kilos of your body weight. That's a lot of water, yes. Uh, yeah, most men don't <laughs> like that. Um, Can you dilute it with whiskey? If you drink alcohol or caffeine, you have to drink more water okay, to make up gotcha. for it. Um, you should avoid caffeine after about two o'clock. Avoid screens with blue lights for one hour before bed. So this is all setting up the sure. sort of physical foundations. If you have a very sedentary job, then trying to move around during the day as much as possible or formal exercise or at least deep breathing to oxygenate your brain. I mean, you, you look at generally high-powered, very successful people. They're very few, how do I put this politely, chunky CEOs. Um, especially, I mean, the, the Americans seem to sort of be very drawn toward the, 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 the picture-perfect CEO, the mm. good teeth and all of that mm. sort of stuff. They're both for their presidents on that basis. <laughs> Donald Trump's got no chance. Um, <laughs> uh, and the, the, there is the sort of ideal cookie-cutter of the CEO, but they generally tend to be fitter, generally tend to be healthier, generally look after their physical self better mm. because they know if that breaks, everything else goes down with them. But that has got the added benefit then of making the brain work better. Absolutely. They've really understood this brain-body connection. And I think in other countries in the world, we're lagging behind a bit on that. So um, we're expecting our brains to perform at a very high standard, but we're not actually giving it the resources that it needs to do that. And um, you know, if you don't do that, if, let's say that you have or you haven't set up a certain you know, level of physical um, con conditions for your brain, 
Then you want to be able to regulate your emotions, suppress your unconscious biases, think outside the box, think flexibly, mm. creatively, solve complex problems, um, multitask, or I prefer to use the term task switch. Um, so those are the higher functions of the brain that we I'm really... I'm so glad you said that. Sorry, task switch. Because multitask is a fallacy. Mm. You can't do more than one thing at once. I'm sorry. Maybe it's just the way I'm wired. But you can do multiple things at various points within the space of an hour. Mm. But you've got to pigeonhole things. That You're absolutely I feel, I feel right. Quite, I feel quite relieved, actually. You're right. So when we multitask, we do each single thing less well than we can do it on mm. its own. So task switching, I'm a big fan of. Okay. Now... The people who do this well are people who obviously plan it, who obviously think mm. about it. Mm. Um, it's not something that sort of happens by itself. There is, it's not an accidental process. No. So it does take a lot of discipline, but what we're interested in from the neuroscience point of view is creating sustainable behaviour change. So at first it can seem difficult, but once you've formed it into a habit, it should just be the way you operate now. So, you know, going for that green tea in the afternoon instead of a coffee, um, always feeling like you can fit in the exercise, that you go to sleep at regular times, that you choose the healthy options when it comes to even being at a nice restaurant. Um, but I think realistically with both myself and my clients it's important to say that things like travel and jet lag can throw you off that schedule and that's okay and you just need to pick yourself up and start again. But, but more and more executives, I mean, mid-level executives, are traveling a lot. I mean, mm. you look at this continent, a lot of people are doing business across this continent. They're not necessarily getting jet lag. Mm. We don't have huge time zone mm -hmm. switches. But you are traveling under mm. often quite arduous conditions, five or six, uh, six hours to get mm. anywhere on this mm. continent. That is significant and it's disruptive. Mm. Uh, Tuesday, uh, you're, you're in Joburg. Wednesday, you're in Addis. And on, on Thursday, you're in Lagos. It's going to have an impact. Mm -hmm. So we had a, a bit of a chat about choice reduction and simplicity as being something that's beneficial to the brain. Choice reduction. Explain this to me. So the brain actually loves simplicity. So the brain would prefer not to be in three different cities in three days. Yeah. And if we, um, particularly in our morning, um, we routinize that then we use up less of our cognitive resources and we save them for bigger and more important That's decisions. So cognitive resources being the capacity we've got to do a, anything in a single day. Yeah, even after an eight hour good sleep, you have a limited bucket of what I call cognitive resources. So if you're deciding what should I wear, what should the children wear, what should we have for breakfast, you're using up those cognitive resources before you get to work. That's a terrifying prospect. Especially if you're somebody who's going to be peaking at a state banquet at 8 o'clock tonight. Exactly. Tomorrow. However, I do say that if you're going through a lot of travel and stress, you should try to do choice reduction and simplify your life. But the travel itself, the, the different experiences, the different cultures, the use of different languages, that actually um, enriches your brain and keeps it plastic and flexible. So leverage both. Okay, co but cognitive reduction, just in practical terms. CEO John wakes up at six o'clock in the morning and goes for his morning run or goes to the gym mm -hmm. uh, and hits the office by 7.30. Mm -hmm. um, has got absolutely crucial budgeting meetings all the way through to lunchtime, mm -hmm. business meeting at lunch, all through the afternoon, more meetings. Five o'clock, he gets on a plane, uh, travels two hours uh, to for an eight o'clock meeting in the next city. I mean, you can't afford to be running out of cognitive resources by five o'clock in the afternoon. No, and I think, you know, there are days like that, but you have to make sure that every day is not like that or that there are sufficient breaks in place that, you know, you can sort of recover your resilience. So we can actually go a lot further than our brain tells us we can. So our brain will start saying, you're tired, you're hungry, stop doing this, you know, this is not good for you. At that stage, we can push ourselves a little bit further, but we do need to make sure that we have the good sleep hygiene that we've... Um, refueled and hydrated ourselves during that day. So does it explain, and uh, I always just thought it was cool and trendy, but the IT geeks who run the world, the Steve Jobses of the world and the Zuckerbergs of the world are, are very, they're not natty dresses, they're very simple dresses. Is that part of this making these cognitive choices on a daily basis? I have a uniform, therefore I don't need to think, therefore I keep some of my brain in reserve for later. Absolutely, I mean I think they're not just not natty dresses, but they wear the same thing every day. And I, I would take a very, you know, sort of um, informed guess that that's the reason they're doing it. But consciously or subconsciously? Consciously. Absolutely consciously. So there are a lot of people out there now, leaders both in politics and in um, business and sport, who are taking these neuroscience messages and using them to their advantage. But everybody can do that. 
Okay, now, when you go into the C-suite and you mm. tell people the story, do they initially, at least, look at you as if you're just a little bit perhaps in need of some of your own medicine? <laughs> um, I do still get the question, what is the connection between neuroscience and leadership? But I pretty much say, if you've got a brain, wouldn't it be better if you knew how it worked mm. and what you had to put in to get the most out of it? And people really get it, and the interest has grown immensely over the last eight years. I mean, I, it's astounding even to me how Do boards see results? Do boards see change? Is there, is there a bottom line benefit to exercising your brain? I mean, you might go for your morning run, mm. but if you're not exercising your brain adequately, you're operating at 80% and you're being paid for 100%. Absolutely. Um, you know, just as exercising improves your physical body, using your brain in the right way and setting it up for success gets more out of it. Can I give you a list of CEOs I think need your help? <laughs> <laughs> Gladly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but where is, I mean, the City of London traditionally is quite bombastic. It's the captains of the universe. It is very confident, mm -hmm. externally at least. Are mm -hmm. you finding that we are facing a, a crisis of confidence, perhaps, in leadership? Yeah, I guess I'm in a really privileged position in that I work with people in London, New York, Singapore, Joburg, and other places um, who confide in me their, their worst fears and their biggest secrets. And... The one phrase that I hear in every industry, in every country, is one day somebody's going to find out that I shouldn't be here and they'll just know that I'm a fraud. And, you know, I've heard that from very, very high profile people. Give us a list. <laughs> You're not going to, are you? No. This interview is over. That's it. Tara Swatt. She is an author. She's a psychiatrist. She has the ear, well, she is the ear. For some of you, you might recognize her, but she's not telling you a secret. You'll be absolutely fine. Thank you for watching. There'll be more Money Makers next time. But for now, have a very good evening. Bye-bye.